Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Monticello live stream. We're here today with Linnea Grimm, uh, the Hunter J. Smith Director of Visitor and Education Programs here at Monticello. And if you tuned into yesterday's live stream, you may recognize my voice. Now you can put a face with the voice. I'm Alice Wagner. I'm one of the guides here uh, at Monticello. Uh, and if you tuned into yesterday's live stream, you'll know that we were talking about visitors to Monticello in Jefferson's time. So we're gonna kind of continue that today and talk a little bit more about visitors after Jefferson. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions yourselves, please put those in the comments. We'd love to get questions from our audience. Uh, and also let us know where you're watching from. Uh, but first, Linnea, I do wanna start with uh, 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 a question about what exactly is your role at Monticello? Sure, well, my full title is certainly a mouthful. <laughs> um, and what I do here at Monticello is really connected to learning experiences. So everyone who works in education visitor programs is thinking about how to connect the history of Monticello with our current visitors, whether they are on site or digitally. Well, we'll get right into it. How long has Monticello been an attraction that people have wanted to come see? Yeah. Um, so I love that question because uh, it has Monticello has such a long history of being an attraction. For those of you who saw yesterday, um, our colleague Bill Barker as Thomas Jefferson uh, talked about the numerous visitors uh, that Thomas Jefferson saw here at Monticello in his time. Uh, people like Margaret Barrett Smith and the Marquis de Lafayette. So certainly even in Jefferson's time, it was an attraction that people wanted to come and see. But it really continued to be an attraction after Jefferson's death. The Levy family, the family who um, was responsible for the upkeep of Monticello for just about 100 years after Jefferson's death, um, wanted to ensure that even though it was a private residence that they owned, that it was open uh, to the public. And so they allowed visitors up during that time. And we know there was interest um, from visitors throughout the 19th century and early 20th century in coming to see Monticello. And we're gonna put up, uh, share an image here of uh, visitors uh, here in the 1880s um, getting their picture taken in front of the West Lawn of Monticello. Um, and then the next picture is from a 1914-1915 time frame, a, a family of a grandmother, two daughters, and a grandson getting their picture taken here at Monticello. There are several things that I think are interesting about this picture that still resonate with visitors today. First, the uh, mother of the child is the one seated directly across from him. And if you look closely, you can tell she's trying to keep him entertained for that picture. Um, and so I know just like uh, children today who come to visit Monticello, he was probably wanted to be running around. Um, and then up in the corner, you can see that there were some rules about visiting Monticello, um, that you're only supposed to spend about 20 minutes on the grounds, that you're not supposed to touch the shrubbery. Um, and we we're just talking about this, that that's still something we ask visitors not to be touching the trees and the shrubbery. Um, and, um, that you're not supposed to be taking your lunch, I believe, up to Monticello as well. So has there always uh, been a tour available? That's also an interesting question. As a historian, I'm always wary of terms like always. Um, however, the um, Thomas Jefferson Foundation, which owns and operates Monticello today, has owned and operated it since 1923. And there have been tours available during that entire time. In the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, the tours were given by African-American men. Um, and then rather abruptly in 1951, there was a shift to using white women as tour guides. Um, they were called hostesses. We have a picture here from the um, early 1950s, I believe, uh, of one of the hostesses at Monticello um, giving a tour in the entrance hall. Um, and we were also talking right before we, we came on air that um, both Alice and I are obviously white women. Um, and there's some, over the last couple of decades, we have worked very hard on diversifying our staff, um, actively recruiting um, for diversity. And we are continuing uh, those efforts today. Uh, about how many visitors do we receive each year and where do they usually come from? Yeah. Um, so over the last 10 years, we've averaged more than 400,000 visitors. 
um, and they come from all over the world. Um, some of our very special visitors are our student visitors. Um, we see about 50 to 60,000 students every year at Monticello, um, and we see a number from Virginia, and I wanna especially acknowledge the long-term relationships that we have with Richmond City Public Schools. We've been working with them just coming up on 20 years of seeing their fourth graders coming here to Monticello every year. Charlottesville City Public Schools um, and Albemarle County Public Schools. We have very long-standing relationships with them and love welcoming the students um, to be coming up here. Um, we see visitors who come as family groups and as um, friends from all over the world. In fact, one time I was giving a tour because I love stepping in to give tours and I was asking some kind of basic warm up questions, see how much people knew about American history, and I was getting nothing. I said, well, what do you know about Thomas Jefferson? Nothing. And I said, okay, maybe they just don't wanna talk. And then as we are entering the first room, they said, we're all from Sweden. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, yes, duly noted. We'll start, we'll start um, at the beginning. Um, but one of the things I really love about my work here at Monticello, while it relates so much to history, it also relates to the present day and bringing people together. So the image that we'll have on the screen here is from 2018, um, look closer event that happened here at Monticello. And this is a reunion of the uh, descendants of the enslaved families at Monticello. Um, and being able to have opportunities like that to bring families together is so meaningful. Um, and even our staff members, um, we asked some of our staff to say like, hey, do you have pictures before you worked at Monticello when you were, just, when you were a visitor here? Um, and they send in pictures of um, people who are really important to, to them, um, sharing this moment with them, um, or even pictures when they were children. Um, and so this is one of our wonderful tour guides, um, Noelle, who is uh, no longer that young, but um, <laughs> she sent in this wonderful picture of when she and her family visited here. Um, and so being able to make, um, allow people to have those family connections and connect with the history of Monticello, I think is one of the most rewarding uh, parts of, the, of working here. I definitely agree with that, yeah. Um, you know, how do visitors tend to react to their visit to Monticello? Yeah. Um, so, and you know this too from being a, from being a guide, um, is that we see all, all, a huge range of, um, of reactions to being here. I think most significantly is usually there is a reaction. Um, and uh, we always talk about being relevant and having, you know, having big emotions and emotional connections to historic sites means that you are relevant. Um, a lot of people we hear from who visit here have talked about wanting to visit here their entire lives. And we've had visitors in tears um, when they've um, entered the house. Uh, one tour guide who no longer works here, one of his favorite stories was talking about a, a, a elderly woman from Italy. She's probably in her 80s or 90s. And um, as they were leaving the house, and she had waited her entire life to be able to be here. As they were leaving the house, she said, this, this is the heart of America. Um, and so we have um, visitors, you know, definitely who, um, who are like her, who are so excited and, and um, really see the patriotic nature of Monticello. And then also Monticello is a site of enslavement um, where over 600 um, human beings were enslaved. And so um, it is a, a painful site. And sometimes we talk about contested history because um, people can see the history of Monticello in many different ways. And I believe that we're gonna be putting up um, some links in the, the chat box um, with some uh, articles um, as well as one poem about perceptions of visiting Monticello um, as an African-American and visiting a plantation um, where ancestors might have been enslaved. And it can be incredibly painful. And so I think what we hear frequently from visitors is that um, you just, there, it, it's complex and there's so many different emotions that people have while they're here. And one of the things that I really value about the Monticello staff is trying to make space and, and hear what those reactions are. Um, Definitely, yeah. yeah. Cause you get those reactions in the same tour. Yeah. 
you know, the people are having different experiences together in the group. And so how do we make sure we have the space for everybody to right. feel what they're feeling? Yeah. Um, one of the links we'll put up is a poem, uh, is a, a link to a poem uh, entitled en Enlightenment by a poet, Natasha Trethaway. Um, and it is such a beautiful example of, um, she is biracial and she visited Monticello with her white father um, and the, the complexity and the complex feelings that she had as a visitor here. So I highly encourage, if you're gonna be following some links, I, I definitely encourage following that link. Well, uh, to uh, shift a little bit on the focus of kind of the everyday visitor, uh, what yeah. about famous people? Uh, who have we seen? Absolutely. I will still say my favorite part of being here is the everyday visitor. I know, and yeah. everyone would then wants to get into the famous visitors, and that's great. <laughs> um, so we've, of course, had a number of famous visitors uh, over the years, and we'll put up um, a few more slides here. And the first slide is our guest book, which shows the third signature down on the left. Uh, you might not be able to read it at first, but it's Marilyn Monroe. Um, she was married to Arthur Miller at that time, and so it says Marilyn Monroe Miller. Um, our research librarian, Anna Burks, has a wonderful blog post on Marilyn Monroe's visit. She tried to come incognito, um, but apparently did not succeed very well. Um, and then our, <laughs> our local newspaper the next day um, was reporting on her visit and seemed quite alarmed that she was not wearing makeup. So oh, geez. <laughs> she didn't have lipstick on several times. Um, but there, there were no pictures because she, she consciously did not want to have um, a picture taken. But I do think it is interesting that Anna uh, in her blog post says, you know, we never know when we're going to discover that somebody was here on that day in 1957 and actually has a picture of her in the background. Right. And I don't know if you think about this, but I sometimes yeah. think about how many backgrounds of pictures I'm in from visitors oh, yeah. all over the world. Oh yeah. You know, I know there's somebody in like all the way other side of the <laughs> earth right now in a photo book and they're like, oh, there I am in the back. Yeah. Well, we've definitely had experiences where like somebody will be famous, but the tour guide who's giving that tour doesn't happen to know who they are. And then there's other tour guides that are like, yes. do you realize who you just have on your tour? Which I'm sure the, the person who's famous loves that, that. Okay. My guy doesn't know who I am. I'm just an everyday person today. Yeah. yeah. So. No. And I've definitely seen that generationally um, mm -hmm. with the tour guides. Uh, right. So, you know, so certain people will know someone and then everyone else will say, um, I, I don't know that person. <laughs> um, let's see. So the next picture I think we have is of somebody most people will recognize, um, <laughs> which is Queen Elizabeth II, uh, who was here at Monticello in 1976 for the celebration of the bicentennial. And um, I thought the, that part uh, it was interesting, particularly uh, if you watch The Crown, so we always talk about pop culture references, mm -hmm. right? If you watch The Crown, this is around the time period where the third season ends. So there's your Monticello connection to The Crown. <laughs> um, and the next image uh, that we have is of Leonard Nimoy and his son here at Monticello in the 1970s. Uh, so we're super excited uh, to find this picture. And um, I think I have most profoundly been impacted by civil rights leaders who have visited Monticello. And we were honored to have John Lewis here in 2015 uh, to receive one of our Founders Day medals. Um, and he gave an incredibly moving speech um, here on the West Lawn of Monticello. And um, I know we'll be able, um, perhaps after the live stream, to be able to share that link um, as well. In addition, we have certainly had many presidents come uh, to visit. Um, I've been working here during uh, two visits of presidents. Uh, George W. Bush, who was our uh, uh, speaker at our July 4th naturalization ceremony, um, and Barack Obama have uh, both visited during the time that I've been here, but certainly presidents have been coming here for a long time. In the uh, 1936, I believe it was, that uh, FDR, um, provided the naturaliz naturalization uh, ceremony speech, um, which seems very powerful, especially right in the midst of the Great Depression yeah. uh, that he was here. And I believe some of the slides we have, we have Gerald Ford, uh, um, Ronald Reagan, and then 
Bill Clinton, um, who started his inaugural festivities right here at Monticello in 1993. Well, we did get a question that came in from Facebook asking, did uh, Jefferson ever mention the idea of opening the house to the public hmm. after his death? Was this something on his mind? So not that I have read, although it wouldn't necessarily surprise me. And the reason I say that, and I'm really glad we got that question, is that Jefferson himself was uh, such a tourist. Um, so we have great stories of how he and John Adams um, were traveling around the English countryside. I mean, just picture Thomas Jefferson, John Adams traveling around the countryside and they go to visit um, Shakespeare's home in Stratford-upon-Avon. And they have this great story of how they were encouraged to chip off a piece of chair. Oh. Oh, which is God. not what we encourage yeah, today. Not what, please don't chip um, off our chairs. And, but Adams and Jefferson make a point of talking about this. But Jefferson is very skeptical that that would actually be the chair if every visitor who was coming right. through was actually taking a piece. Um, and then a little bit later, he also wrote advice to um, American travelers who were traveling in Europe. And it's fantastic because the advice he gives is that um, you should first always take advantage of getting a chance to see something because you never know when you'll ba be back in the area to see it again. And then second, to be really careful of um, stewards or porters who were the guides you know, around cathedrals um, to make sure that they weren't trying to tell you too much. <laughs> uh, that is a danger. <laughs> they would um, wear out your memory essentially. And so we use that sometimes in training because we know right. as guides, we're just so excited to be sharing information with yeah. people. So back to the great question, which is, um, I don't, I don't, he valued his privacy so much, you know, certainly and during his life, he didn't want it to be a, a tourist attraction. It wouldn't surprise me if he thought maybe one day that his home would be like Shakespeare's home, um, right? <laughs> script to think about. All right, well, um, how has visiting Monticello changed in the 14 years that you've been here? Yeah, um, so I would say in the 14 years that I've been here, there, there are really two big changes. And the first is uh, being a site that is more conscious of being inclusive. Uh, we finished a few years ago a, a major restoration project on the mountaintop that really restored the landscape of slavery. Um, and we are conscious and always working, and it, it, it is a trajectory um, of always working on telling inclusive um, history. The second thing that I've seen that I've really seen over the last 14 years is, um, is visitor focus um, priority. And um, I've always been impressed with Monticello. The research that we have done is just phenomenal. Colleagues, we know, um, they just know so much. Um, so anytime if you have a chance to be at Monticello and you're walking around, and my mind is a lot like sometimes watching a really finely crafted movie where maybe it's the second or third time you see some small detail. Everything at Monticello has some story and possibly somebody who's written a dissertation about you know, some small detail of, of the plantation. Um, and what I love in the, especially the last 14 years is that we've really stood on the shoulders of the people who've done this tremendous research. And we're really thinking about how do we connect this research, um, be able to provide meaningful connections to people who are here uh, today. And that's something that I, that I love is this combination of scholarship um, and visitor focus. Well, and of course this year, things have been very different as we all know. Um, how has the pandemic changed the visitor experience? I mean, obviously this is one of the things, the live right, streams. Right, live streams and, but, um, and virtual programming in general. Um, so earlier we were talking about visitation and visitation numbers to Monticello. Um, and one of the really interesting things you see in visitation numbers, just as a quick sidebar, is that in the late 1940s and early 1950s, post-war with the rise 
rise of um, families taking vacations in cars, you see this dramatic jump from like 100,000 visitors to 200,000 visitors at Monticello in the course of five or six years. Um, this year, because of closure, we were closed for nearly three months. Um, as well as now, and I'll talk a little bit about our safety measures and the caps. I think we our, our visitation um, might be a little closer to those 1940s numbers, which for those of us who love visitors is, yeah. is, is so hard yeah. um, to, to be seen. That said, I couldn't be prouder of working with the Monticello staff in how we've done what we've done on site to reopen. Um, in eight weeks, the Monticello staff were able to rethink the entire visitor experience. Um, and so we talked about tours and how important tours are and how we love giving tours. We knew that wasn't gonna be an option when we reopened because of social distancing. Um, and so we had to rethink every element of this onsite experience that had been that way for 60, 70 years, and we did it. Well, we reopened on June 13th with many measures in place. Um, and um, we have an experience that where we're still able to share um, our, the history of this place with, uh, with many people who are, who are coming today. Uh, so that model is very much more of a kind of a self-guided experience with different yeah. aids, you know, audiovisual guides who are positioned where you can ask us questions. Uh, have you seen any kind of unexpected benefits from that model? Yeah. You know, it's a different experience Absolutely. than a guided tour, but. Um, yeah, so there is a lot of um, more self-guided throughout the property. Um, and one of the big benefits to this, because we are pulsing traveling parties into the house um, in their individual groups so that we can maintain distancing. But it has meant for the first time that we can allow photography to happen in the inside the house. And guests have um, loved that. Mm -hmm. um, for many years, photography wasn't allowed um, because we didn't necessarily have the rights to take images right. because some of the objects are on loan to us um, so that the foundation doesn't own everything. But also you can imagine if you have a group of 25 people within a certain space and everyone pulls out their camera and they're like backing up, <laughs> like that's yeah. you know, not the best experience for everyone in the group as well as we're thinking about the protection of our collection. Um, but the way that we've changed things for COVID has a, uh, really easily allowed for that photography to happen. Um, and yeah. we'll see even, post COVID times, we, we yeah. hopefully will find a way. And I know I've had some comments from visitors who are return visitors, you know, they've been to Monticello several times before and they're commenting that like, oh, now I can sit there and like stare at all the books yeah. in the bookcase and look at it, right. you know, all the titles. So there's kind of these details that they're yeah. picking up and that's, it's always kind of cool to have them share that with Absolutely. me. And, you know, and, and you get that opportunity to talk about, hey, I, I've never actually talked that much about Jefferson and Don Quixote, you know, right. and, but this visitor noticed it and now I can yeah. talk about it, so. Right, and they, they get to see those details and I've definitely heard that um, and that, that chance of seeing and seeing authentic objects um, is so important um, mm -hmm. to guests and so I've, I've appreciated that. I think the other thing that we've been able to do, we were talking about this a little bit before we were, um, came live today, is that you, um, you can't have a moving tour easily. Um, and so anytime you have a group of people, uh, anyone who's at home, just, you know, notice this the next time you're walking, you naturally get closer together. And so something that we've done is for the places where we're using our amazing guide staff is that we have seated stationed areas where everyone can be seated on benches and that way we can maintain our, our social distancing and it allows our guides to do what they're so great at. Um, and then also this pivot to doing digital programming. We're yeah. getting to talk to so many people yeah. and share again this love of the history of the site with people all over the world um, through live streams, through our live virtual tours. So there are, there are definitely um, some positives. And speaking of our live streams and our wonderful audience here, we did get another question. This one's from uh, Connie and she wanted to know if there was one thing we could do to enrich visitor experience, what would it be? Hmm. That is a great question. And you should be thinking on this one. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I know, so, well. um, so what I would love to be able to do is 
paint the big picture of Monticello. So when you come to Monticello, you have the chance to see all the famous things that you have heard about. Um, but then layer in with more details about what is somebody's specific interest. Um, so I'm an amateur cellist. And if I were visiting Monticello, I still want to see the clock and the, you know, all the right. blockbuster type of objects that we have. Um, but I think one of the things that we could work towards to enriching more visitor experiences is, is then saying, okay, you've seen this, but what is it, what are you particularly excited about? And it doesn't have to be an entire tour about cellos. It could just be <laughs> like, hey, did you know that cello music was played in, in the parlor or something like that? Yeah. What do you, did you have any thoughts? I don't know. It's a, it's a really good question, Connie, and uh, something, I mean, I think, we are in this unique position of rethinking things because of COVID. Um, so we're pulling up a lot of the, the digital aspect of it. I've been really involved yeah. um, with this, even though you haven't heard my voice on the live streams, I have been involved with the, the live stream process. Um, so I don't know, somehow folding in, like we talked a little bit about photography and stuff, but if there's yeah. a way to fold in the digital world now, like not just, when you're sitting right. at home, but you know, on site as well. And I'm, I'm literally coming up with this right now. So I know this is not very specific. <laughs> no, but um, I think but, there's a, there's something that we've definitely yeah. been talking about of the enrichment of people's personal perceptions and feelings about being at Monticello. Like I said earlier, yeah. there's so, so many large feelings connected to this. And I think enriching the visitor experience even more by letting people share those with others um, mm -hmm. digitally um, is definitely. Yeah, and well, and thinking yeah. too about um, like the, the Sally Hemings exhibit, which if you haven't had a chance to check it out on our website, you can, if you go to life, just you know, search life of Sally Hemings on the website, it'll pull up a video that was done, what, a year or two ago? Well, we opened that in 2018. Yeah, um, yeah so. So, um, you know, that kind of visual experience of, you know, giving you a, a different view on Sally Hemings' life that's not just the guy telling you about it, right. that you're hearing the words of, her son talking about her life and and so those sort of things as well I think yeah I definitely see and helps uh, bring people to life you know that that lived and worked mm -hmm. at Monticello and everyone who's watching please feel free to put things in the comments about what do you think would in um, make the visit to Monticello even more powerful I mean that was one of the yeah. other really important things that I think we do now more than ever at Monticello is really listen to our visitors and our potential visitors what can we do so thank you for that question. It gives us some food for thought. Um, so kind of back on the, the pandemic uh, aspect of it, how are we ensuring the safety of our staff and visitors? You touched on this a little bit, but yeah. what are some other things we're doing? As I mentioned, we um, really in about eight weeks had to think through so many details of the on-site visitor experience. Um, so we are definitely doing all recommended um, CDC as well as uh, state and local uh, ordinances. Um, and most importantly, of course, as everyone knows, is um, the requirement of wearing a mask. Um, and then social distancing, we have thought through very carefully every point along the way at Monticello, how to maintain that social distancing, um, as well as asking guests themselves to be very mindful of it. We have more hand sanitizing stations um, than I, I thought possible. <laughs> so kudos to my colleagues uh, who work so hard on procuring those. Um, and so we're, we're able to really um, try to maintain um, cleaning hands uh, very frequently. Um, and then the other important thing we've done is capped the visitation, um, as I mentioned. And so because we have um, shuttle buses that can, all, we have to re greatly reduce the number of people on shuttle buses as well as the house capacity, um, we have a, a daily maximum capacity, which means frequently we're selling out. I don't know um, today necessarily, but I looked yesterday and I think just about every day um, I can remember in recent past um, we've mm -hmm. been selling out. So we have time for one last question. So mm -hmm. for anybody who's thinking about coming to visit yeah. us right now, what advice do you have for them? Sure. First, I think, I, I really do believe this. Um, 
is, is that we are a great site to visit at this point um, for, an, for a number of reasons. First, for the safety protocols that we've put in place. Secondly, um, for the amount of open space we have. And I know a lot of people think, oh, Monticello, back of the nickel, you're just the, the house. But as I've been talking about, uh, it's a historic plantation and there is a lot of outdoor space. So it is easy, especially walking around the property to stay um, so, uh, um, socially distanced. Um, if you're coming, as I mentioned, we are selling out. So I highly recommend reserving your tickets uh, online in advance. Um, one of the other changes we have had to make is a, only allowing clear plastic bags like they do at stadiums for um, football games. Um, and the reason for that is that we do a bag check and you can imagine you can't do social distancing if you're doing a bag check. Um, and so we had to switch to that clear plastic bag um, process. And then obviously bring your mask, 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 mask. Um, let's see, but I, I think it really is a great time to visit. I think it's a great time for families to visit. Again, with the walkthrough model that's self-guided, uh, remember back to that early picture of the mother with the, the like, it looked like about a three-year-old. Um, it's much easier to accommodate um, going through the house um, in that way. So, and we have yes. lots of outdoor stations as well. Yep. So expect that it's not just going to be the house. You're going to get to do lots of other right. things um, too. Bill Barker, um, as I mentioned, our wonderful colleague who portrays Thomas Jefferson is um, outdoors uh, five days a week. Uh, interacting with guests. We have a station about slavery at Monticello and about gardens and grounds. Um, so we very much hope that people will come and visit yes, us. Definitely. Well, thank you all for joining us here. We hope to see you in the future, both on Facebook uh, uh, and uh, in person. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.